Thank you everyone for joining us here today, lovers of dance, history, architecture, and community activism. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel, Chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center. We are a group of dedicated individuals committed to informing the public about the past, the present, and future of our city. Our warmest thanks go to 601 Frederick Douglass Boulevard and to the National Dance Institute for their interest, assistance, and support. And thanks too to each of you for joining us here today to commemorate the life and the remarkable work of dancer, choreographer, director, and educator, Jacques D'Amboise. For those who asked, the Zoom program today will be recorded and the video will be made available at the David M. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Duke University and the New York Historical Sci Society's Diamondstein Spielvogel newly formed archive. Jacques began his ballet training at the age of eight with Madame Seda in Washington Heights, New York. Within the year, he moved to the School of American Ballet and at age 12, he performed with Ballet Society, the immediate predecessor to the New York City Ballet. When barely 15, he left high school and joined NYCB. The and the following year, he made his European debut at London's Covent Garden. As Balanchine's protege, Jacques D'Amboise had more works choreographed specifically for him by the exacting ballet master than any other dancer. He's remembered for his portrayal of what critics called the definitive Apollo and partnered some of the leading female dancers of his generation, including Suzanne Farrell, Diana Adams, and Allegra Kent, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. As a choreographer, D'Amboise's credits include almost 20 works commissioned for NYCB. His career also extended to Broadway, where he performed in the musical Shinbone Alley, the precursor to the musical Cats, and to film, including, not surprisingly, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, Carousel, and The Best Things in Life are Free. He also wrote and directed for theater, film, television, and musicals. But it was his work as a dancer, educator, and founder of the National Dance Institute in 1976. You saw a snippet of their work to begin in that opening video clip for Once in My Life. That seems to have the greatest remarkable and most lasting impact globally. Jacques' work in dance education took him from Siberia to Ethiopia, from the Dead Sea to the mountains of Nepal, and from the Chilean desert to the rainforests of Hawaii. During the last 45 years, NDI programs here in New York City and their affiliates nationally, and now you gather internationally, reached and influenced well over 2 million children, an extraordinary achievement. Jacques' contributions in dance education were recognized with numerous awards and honors, including MacArthur Award, the Kennedy Center Honor, the National Medal of the Arts, the Fred and Adele Astaire Awards, and 12 honorary doctorates. He was, in truth, a Pied Piper of dance. He never forgot how dance propelled him out of a street gang and gave him an outlet for creativity and self-expression. He recognized, as he once said, 
and I'll quote, the arts open your heart and mind to possibilities that are limitless. And he shared this belief and his gifts with the world. And now for our speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Kay Gaynor. Kay is the Artistic Director of National Dance Institute. She began teaching there in 2000 and served as assistant to Jacques, responsible for the direction of NDI's in-school program, which serve approximately 6,500 children in New York City public schools. Welcome, Kay. Uh, she, uh, since 2014, she has served as co-creator and co-founder of the NDI Dream Project, which provides children with disabilities the opportunity to dance and perform alongside a group of age-matched peers. Thank you for joining us, Kay. Thank you, Barbara Lee. And thank you to the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center for making this entire event possible. Um, to the condo board of 2601, especially Nicola Medrano, I wanna thank you for making this such a smooth process. I understand it's not always that way and we're very, very grateful. Um, and to Emily Reed, Jacques' assistant and mine who brings love, expertise and good humor to everything she does. With you, Barbara Lee, um, Emily is really the one who helped get this project across the finish line. And we are so, so deeply grateful to be able to honor Jacques in this way. Uh, I also, also want to give a shout out to Anthony, who installed the medallion yesterday, and Steve from Spanger Designs, who fabricated the medallion, who, as it turns out, not surprisingly, had uh, has a child who participated in an NDI program in a school here locally in New York. Um, with Jacques, it is and was always a very small and very spectacular world. <laughs> he called himself a New Yorker with a fancy name, but he was a legend in the world of dance, best known as a principal dancer with New York City Ballet, and then as a genius in arts education for the founding of National Dance Institute. New York City Ballet was his artistic home for more than 30 years, and 2601 Frederick Douglass Boulevard here in Harlem became his home for the last 12 years, with the NDI Center for Learning and Arts right up the street from here. I've been thinking a lot about Jacques' resume, all that he accomplished, all the awards, and also about his legacy, the future of NDI and how we might live up to his goals, his vision, and the course he charted for us. There's a lot to say about all of that, but more than anything else, I want people to remember and understand what it was like to be around him to remember how the air, the expectations and outcomes changed when Jacques was in the room. Jacques Dumboise was my mentor, my teacher, friend, fellow hiker, swimmer, rock climber, adventure enthusiast, always artistic inspiration. He believed in the necessity and the importance of the arts beyond the world of ballet, beyond the pursuit of a, prof of a professional career. He wanted to make the experience of dance high quality dance accessible to everyone and not just everyone in new york but everyone on the planet he used to say that it was common sense teaching common sense it's common sense but he was a genius as a teacher he used challenges and games uh storytelling and adventure he had us turn the room around he had us divide the room so we could see every child and he always said the child who struggles is the most important person in the room and centering every single child um, opened their imaginations and caught them by the imaginations to help them fall in love with the arts. These days in education, we talk a lot about scaffolding risk taking as essential to a child's growth and education. And by scaffolding, we mean creating a sense of safety in the room, teaching skills step by step. Shock didn't really do scaffolding. Um, he just threw us in the deep end back in the day. But his belief was so strong, it buoyed everyone who came near him, a flotation device for the brave. Back in the day, uh, working for Jacques was not for the faint of heart, but his belief was so strong that uh, there was no possibility of sinking. 
so many things that I have done in my career, so many roles I played, projects accomplished, were because Jacques told me to, and he believed me into being capable of doing them. Go teach this group of children at a community center and come back with a finished dance in three hours. Okay. <laughs> Sub for Judy Collins and sing a song for an audience of thousands at Madison Square Garden. Okay. Understudy Eli Wallach. Teach this dance to children who are blind or have low vision. Make your own version of Midsummer Night's Dream for 200 children. Uh, I'm taking you to Moscow to teach, choreograph, and organize visas for all the children and staff who will be coming to New York for the event of the year in three weeks. Go start a program in China, Kay. Mary, take up a step, then do it triple the speed. Now go teach that in Bali. <laughs> this was Jacques. Bianca, make a film of your cello suites choreography. Dufton, come to Israel, and we'll make a program for Palestinian and Israeli children to dance together. Ellen Weinstein, take over NDI. <laughs> He set the bar high and knew that children will always rise to the occasion, and he did the same for all of us. The world was his dance floor, and everywhere he went felt like home. He always wanted to know your story. To Jacques, drawing stories out of people was one of the essential joys of being alive. I remember being in a Chinese restaurant um, with a collection of Jacques' friends. Jacques was always feting important people. And at a certain point in the conversation, he picked up somebody's phone and called Harvard University to ask scientist Lisa Randall to please clarify a point about dark matter for everyone at the table. That was Jacques. No person was unimportant. He would get out of, out of a cab with a life story and an invitation for the cab driver's child to join the NDI SWAT team. Every person was important. Every person was fascinating. He loved figuring things out, reading the room, surprising, maybe shocking people a little bit. <laughs> he always believed that being unpredictable and storytelling, really good storytelling, were the key to keeping people engaged theatrically and as a teacher of children. And I bet many of us in the room have experienced this, the way Jacques made you feel like the most exciting and most important person in the room. He could do that with 1,000 children, make every single child feel like they mattered and what they were doing was not only important, but essential. One child who experienced the program years ago said, it's not always fun, but it always leads to fun. That was life with Jacques and home. He loved this building and he loved the people in it. Over the last 12 years, one of the th first things he would say when he would come up to our apartment for dinner was I love my apartment so much and these people here, these people here, I love them all. So thank you to 2601 for giving him a home and a place to remember the beating heart and vitality of Jacques D'Amboise. Thank you. And thank you, Kay Gaynor. Um, you've certainly given us a real insight for those who did not know Jacques you certainly captured his essence, and I can't thank you enough for your help. And you're quite right about Emily Reed. She was uh, the assistant at NDI who helped bring all these parts together. Thank you, Emily. And now we turn to the famous, acclaimed Edward Villela, who was also the founding artistic director of the Miami City Ballet. He's one of the principal performers of the New York City Ballet, where he was celebrated for his soaring leaps and jumps. A notable interpreter of the dramatic title role in a revival of George Balanchine's Prodigal Son, 62 years ago in 1960, Lello also created the roles of Oberon in A Midsummer Night's Dream and Harlequin in Harlequinade, both by Balanchine. He danced as the inaugural of John F. Kennedy and performed for Presidents Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. He is the recipient of numerous awards and honorary doctorates, and he received both the National Medal of the Arts and the Kennedy Center Honors. He has written a significant memoir called Prodigal Son, Dancing for Balanchine in a World of Pain and Magic. Thank you, Edward, for joining us. I noticed 
that a young choreographer, Claudia Schreier, recently used Prodigal Son and your example in a series that she did. It's a pleasure to welcome you here. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk about a pal, uh, a, a wonderful buddy, uh, and, and yet we were competitive. It was, a, it was a lovely relationship, and it basically started at the old School of American Ballet on Madison Avenue. That's a long time ago. And uh, the, the person who got me there, of course, was my mother, because I used to hang out the streets in Queens where I grew up. And she would take my sister off to a ballet school and they would come home and find that I had got knocked unconscious by a baseball or had been in a tussle or something like that. And it was fascinating uh, to, to be John, an uh, energetic guy and very positive, quick mind. And uh, he had this this great Irish sense of humor. And uh, we would giggle and laugh as kids, and then we would tussle. And I would say to him, Jacques, listen, you're bigger, you're much taller, but I'm quicker. I'm a quicker guy than you. <laughs> and then we would continue that. And he'd make me late for my train to go back to Queens. Uh, as, as time went by, uh, we became appreciative of each other's interest in, in what Lincoln Kirstein and George Pallet, she along with Jerry Robbins had provided. Uh, it was a fascinating circumstance for me. I had the artist of backgrounds. Uh, I have a bachelor of science degree in marine transportation. I'm, I'm the graduate of uh, Fort Schuyler, the New York State Maritime College. My father did not want his son to dance. And there was Jacques, who was showing us the way to go. And I followed and say, said to him, Jacques, this is fun. This is the way it should be. And uh, he was always a man uh, who had this this kind of sense of allowing people to follow because of that incredible Irish charm. And uh, he became examples for all of us. And of course, for Balanchine and Balanchine in particular. The repertoire that Balanchine made for Jacques will never go away. These are masterworks, absolute masterworks. And there he was, the inspiration for all of those things. He could do that. But he also uh, inspired a lot of young guys, such as myself, whose father did not want his sons to wear tights. Uh, it was a very uncomfortable thing to fall in love with this thing called ballet. But <laughs> shock allowed us to see the beauty, the wonder, the extraordinary invention that was available to all of us. And uh, I, will, I will never, ever go back without thanking Balanchine, Kirstein, Robbins, uh, Karinska. What an incredible array of people. Uh, so, uh, my thanks is both to Jacques, and in particular to Jacques, but also Jacques's understanding of the most complicated repertoire you could ever imagine that was made for him. This was a charming, delightful, quick-minded, wonderful human being. Jacques, bless you.
Thank you, Edward. Thank you for that compelling tribute to your fellow dancer. And thank you for all that you have done for ballet, both as a dancer and the head of what has become one of the most significant companies in the country, the Miami City Ballet. Thank you for joining us here today. Our next speaker is Jennifer Homans. She is the founder and director of the Center for Ballet and the Arts at New York University, where she is also a distinguished scholar in residence in history and European and Mediterranean studies. He's the author of Apollo's Angels, A History of Ballet, a remarkable book, which was named one of the New York Times 10 best books of the year. And that was several years ago. She has a big surprise in store coming this fall. Jennifer was the dance critic for the New Republic and is now the dance critic for the New Yorker. Before becoming a writer and a scholar, Holmans was a professional dancer. She has recently completed what I've just referred to, a very important book to be published this November. I have the correct date, Jennifer. Entitled, this is really on everyone's cannot miss list, Mr. B, George Balanchine's 20th century. Thank you, Jennifer, for your center, for your scholarship, and for what I know will be one of the most important books of the fall. Rumor has it that it will also be serialized in one of the most significant magazines. And I don't know if I'm permitted to tell, but it's your book, you tell. Welcome, Jennifer. Barbara Lee, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, introduction. How kind of you. Um, and yes, I um, thank you for mentioning my book, which I which I am uh, grateful above all to Jacques D'Amboise for his great insight into George Balanchine. So I just want to, to talk a little bit today um, you know, we've heard from two of the people closest to Jacques and who know him uh, so, so well. My experience with Jacques um, also began uh, a long time ago when I was a teenager at the School of American Ballet and, and um, he would stand in the back of the room in someone else's class actually and, and, and he would pull people aside and, and he, he I, I was fortunate enough to be one of those people and he would coach us sort of in the, in the back of the room, there was something so incredibly um, generous about the way he did it. It was just, it, it was not about him. He, he wanted us to know how to do a tendu better. He, he knew and he wanted us to know. And I, I later understood that this was a kind of, you know, he had this enormous charisma and it was really a charisma born out of generosity out of immense generosity um, once he said to me we're going to do a waltz and he took me in, into the waltz position and then he stopped and he said no 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 don't do anything just relax don't do anything i was ready to you know get in there and do it and trying to be a good partner to the great job d'amboise this was such a moment for me and he just, I've never felt anything like that to be carried around a space in like air. It was extraordinary and I never forgot it. I worked for NDI for a couple of years and as Kay said, you know, he just knew what people should be doing somehow. And I thought, you know, because I had been a dancer, I would work on the dance side of things. And he said, no, no, you will be, a, you, you're a writer. You're going to be a writer, you're writing. So you're going to write curriculum materials for us here, do this. And so 
so I did. So I did. And, and of course, he, he was right. And he, you know, took me to India. And he, I was with him in Israel on the Dead Sea at the lowest place in the world. And he had this extraordinary capacity to be um, so welcoming and generous to the point where, you know, when we got to the Dead Sea, there was no they hadn't planned for me. And so there was no room for me to stay in. And I was sort of saying, well, it doesn't matter. I can sleep anywhere. And he's like, no, 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 you'll stay with us. So there was Carrie, his wife, and me and Jacques in a room. And I would sleep on the floor and they would sleep in the bed. And, and you know, good night, Jacques. Good night, Carrie. Good night, Jennifer. <laughs> it was very, very sweet. The three of us just working together and, and camping together. Um, he he never came without a gift whenever i saw him and he many times this gift was a poem often a sufi poem um and it, it was just you know i've never known anyone like jacques and then when i started to work on my balanchine book about 10 years ago i immediately called jacques and and he was again so generous he spent hours and hours with me he taught me about Balanchine. He shared with me papers and letters and personal documents. It was extraordinary. He even one afternoon stood on the platform, and this is the kind of thing Jacques would do. He stood on the platform at the West, West 4th Street subway and danced the full Apollo for me right there because he wanted to show me right now what, what it was. And so that's what he did. Um, and as I studied Balanchine, I began to understand better a little bit, I think, um, the extraordinary artistry that, that, that Jacques brought uh, to the New York City Ballet, which uh, Edward Villela has already, of course, um, shed so much light on. Um, and what I, what I came to realize is, you know, that he, Balanchine would, would um, say, he's like me, he goes his own way because you know and lots of people told me this because Jacques was everywhere he was had a hunger which is an aspect of generosity i think to do as barbara lee said broadway film tv um he did apollo his own way not not with a a, a fancy costume at, at the way it had done been done at other moments he said no i want to be like uh, someone from my generation you know hair slicked back like Elvis. And you know, Balanchine loved it and he, he, he said, fine. He followed his path when he established NDI as Kay has, has told us. But above all, he, he was so close to Balanchine, I think that he became a kind of amanuensis and he, he could, um, you know, he called Balanchine the breath, the breath meaning the spirit, I think, you know, animating life and animating him. And so there's a kind of alchemy of art going on here where Jacques can be himself, but also be balancing in a kind of spirit. And, you know, in works like Meditation or Don Quixote, when he danced the lead roles in both of those those ballets, he, he, who else could have done that? I mean, other people did, but he was really the one sort of capturing the whole ethos of it and the emotion that Balanchine was putting into it. Um, so there we were, it was a, it was a, it was a, it's an odd thing in a way, you know, the kid from Washington Heights and the, the artist from St. Petersburg, but really they were both artists. And so there they were seeing each other not always easily, but with great passion. So just, I, I just thought I would end with a, with a small story that happened um, more recently um, when I was at the theater once with Jacques and another friend and he arrived as he always did with a gift. And he looked at us and he said, I've brought you blueberries, the most glorious blueberries in the world. And he reached out to hand us the blueberries. And as he did, we didn't get them. Whatever happened, they spilled all over the floor of the theater and they streamed down the incline 
into other people's parts of the theater. They streamed sort of all over the theater. And it was kind of glorious because it was sort of like his spirit. It just couldn't be contained. And now everybody had blueberries and had the spirit of Jacques around them. And I just feel like one of the luckiest people alive to have known him and to have have had experienced his extraordinary have seen has witnessed some small part of his extraordinary life so thank you Jacques and thank you everybody who has spoken of Jacques and will speak of Jacques and it's just been one of the great moments of my life to know him Thank you for that incredible description. And we know that Jacques plays a significant role in your very important new book, Mr. B, George ba Balanchine's 20th Century. Uh, I know that everybody will hear about it because that's the kind of writer you are and that's the kind of storyteller you are. And some degree of your passion and erudition was just shared with all of us. Thank you for being here today, Jennifer. Our next speaker is a long time, 52 years if I recall correctly, close friend together with his remarkable wife, Susan, of Jacques and Carrie uh, D'Amboise. He is now retired from his distinguished career and dedicates himself to finding a treatment, cure, and preventative measures for the dementia caused by frontotemporal degeneration, a disease that affected his wife and his brother. He is the director of the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration, which funds research, supports the affected and their care partners and increases awareness of the disease among professionals and the public. Donald has been a devoted supporter of the arts for many years together with Susan, who sadly passed away about seven -ish years ago. And she was a founding board member of NDI and director emerita of NDI but they have been very close, close friends and spend many happy hours together. Thank you for joining us, Donald. Thank you, Barbara Lee. These are my golden memories of Jacques and Carrie. My wife, Susie and Carrie met when their sons were in first grade and Jacques, Carrie, Sue, and I became fast friends. We had many an evening together and many a Sunday brunch. Carrie had a secret formula for Kedgeri. <laughs> we traveled together to Europe and vacationed together in Jamaica. Jacques introduced us to his world of ballet backstage when he performed and post-performance when the ravenous Jacques and his partner had a late dinner at a restaurant and talked ballet and about past performances. And on one memorable, memorable evening, Jacques, Carrie, Sue and I dined with George Balanchine. Jacques loved to talk about his early life, about the boss, his mother, five foot tall, whose word was the law, and the, about the company trips abroad. Jo Jacques had warmth, a charm, a disciplined toughness, an explosion of ideas, and the drive to carry them out. He was fun, he was curious, he was charismatic, he was a force of nature. He was a man for all seasons. Jacques' dancing days came to an end and he exploded with the idea of teaching young males 
in the New York City public schools during their middle school years to appreciate ballet by teaching them to dance. And he and Sue and Eden Lipson and Neil Johnson created National Dance Institute in the late 1970s. Only they quickly learned that events in the public schools could not be unisex. So they, the idea expanded to boys and girls. As the memory of Jacques dancing embedded in film is Jacques legacy, NDI blossomed and became Jacques second legacy, enjoyed by thousands upon thousands of children in the New York City schools and in New Jersey and many other cities in the US and in China and in Mexico and on and on. A legacy like this plaque today, which keeps his name alive. Thank you, Barbara Lee, for allowing me to recall my years with Sue, Jock, and Carrie. And thank you all for celebrating your memories of a mythic great man. Thank you. Donald, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Are there any, any favorite dances? For example, I can always remember some of his annual dance-a-thons held in uh, a school on the Upper West Side. And my favorite, I believe, was to see the entire stage filled with dancing New York City policemen. And another time to see the entire stage filled with dancing nuns. But nothing was greater than that scene that opened this of all those children totally immersed, involved in dancing with all the passion and commitment that you would hope for. Thank you again for being with us. And now we will turn to our next speaker. Appointed in May, 2017, that's just five years ago, as the seventh president of the Juilliard School, Damien Wetzel also serves director of the Aspen Institute Arts Program and artistic director of the annual Vail Dance Festival in August. In 2008, not so long ago, he retired from an illustrious career as a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet. From 2009 to 2017, he was an independent director, choreographer, and producer. Damien Wetzel served on the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, where he helped create the Turnabout Arts Program to bring arts education to some of the nation's actually most limited circumstances. Um, and the most challenged school districts. He earned a master's degree in public administration from Harvard's Kennedy School and has been a visiting lecturer at the Harvard Law School. He received a Harvard Arts Medal and given to distinguished graduates or faculty members who has achieved excellence in the arts and contributed to education for the public good. Well, you deserve several medals for that, Dam Damien. Thank you for all that you've done and for all that you do and welcome to this program. Thank you, Barbara Lee. Thank you for inviting me to get to speak today uh, about, uh, about Jacques. And first of all, let me just say the getting to hear all of the previous speakers adds to uh, immeasurably, and I, I can only just kind of say thank you for all of those memories and all of those insights, which added up to uh, so the, the, the range of Jacques was just, you know, he was a giant, 
giant. Uh, and from the first time I heard his name and I would hear it often said and how people speak about you tells you things. And people said, oh, you should have seen how Jacques did it. Jacques would get ready for this or Jacques would do that. And it was uh, giant, giant. Um, so I thought, you know, just to, to reflect on that, you know, I think about him in so many different ways, as we heard, you know, obviously as the dancer. Uh, but in that regard, I always think about he's the pioneer, you know, and along with Edward uh, and Mr. Mitchell in particular, the three of them created this opportunity for someone like me to become a ballet dancer. This was the, this was the, the foundation of we too can do this. Uh, coming out of the, the you know, World War II and that sense that America had a place in these classical arts and could build institutions. And I sit in one right now. And I look at the New York State Theater where I got to dance along with, you know, all of my colleagues and Edward and Jacques and Arthur and that sense of purpose that was built out of those years. It didn't exist, just didn't happen. Lincoln dreamt it with Mr. Balanchine and so it would be. And we got to do that because of the work. And when I think of Jacques, I think of that, that mighty yop that he had, he would stand there. It was described to me that he would walk to the front of the stage and he put his foot over the footlights and bow and take control of destiny, essentially, and say, this is what I'm gonna do. And I remember thinking that as a child growing up, knowing who he was, knowing his impact, and then when I arrived in New York and my first experiences with him were characteristic, the honesty, the, 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 just the clear brilliance and the always present, always present. Jacques was never down. Jacques was not off, Jacques was on. I would catch sight of him literally in the audience and it would give me energy. I would see him in the front wing. I remember doing Stars and Stripes and he was standing downstage left as I marched off and it was, everything. It was thrilling. It was scary. And as I walked by, he went, yes. And I thought, okay, this is it. I remember Tchaikovsky Padada, and I remember him coaching me afterwards on stage right. And, you know, and, and you too, Edward, uh, stage right in Saratoga. I remember you coaching me in Chai Pa. This is the gift, the food that people give to the next generations and sets the table for everything that's to come. Uh, and Jacques would, you know, as he had a light touch in so many ways for someone with such a big presence, just like he did as a dancer, it was a light touch. He could stand there and be land softly like a cat and yet sail through the air. And, you know, in many ways, that sophistication of, of dancing uh, is something we have to fight for in this generation because it's gotten very uh, uh, correct in a funny way. It's like, it's, we know what it is and we do it. Jacques would sail through the air in a position and just move across the stage from one side to the other in Stars and Stripes. Sauté, cabriole, sail. Incredible. And he would transmit that. I remember him, that rehearsal on the side of the stage where he said, you know, when you, when you partner, you're dancing. And he would, he would dance as he partnered. And he would, you know, inevitably recite half his poetry of dance and the purpose of dance. And he would inject meaning into everything that he did. And when we think about the impact of NDI and the 2 million children around the world who've been affected by that purpose, that sense that dance and music are something that elevates on a practical level, they teach how to learn through the arts and on an emotional and personal level, they just give us a sense of aspiration. And on a community level, they teach us how to be together, how to actually exist together. And in a fragmented world, nothing is more important today than ever before, than that type of an attitude. So we can be grateful to Jacques for that. I'm personally grateful. I have the dance festival in Vail every summer and now year round to celebrate the beat program of which is a, uh, a descendant of NDI run by Tracy Strauss. We get to carry on that legacy for new generations of children. And it is a gift. It is a gift that we've been given by Jacques. Uh, he wrote a bio, uh, I was a dancer. 
it was mistitled. He was, he, I am a dancer, he should have said, because he always was. He would walk down the street and you knew it was Jacques D'Amboise. You just saw it. Union Jack, I was just thinking about that, thinking about those wings. And I remember I did Jacques' part in that and people would say, you know that when Jacques did this, he would start his entrance from the back wall and he'd start walking in time. And I tried to do that every time. I always tried to line up and just live in those shoes because they were so big and so important and so necessary to emulate. Uh, you know, his sense of purpose, I think, guided him through, through those pioneering times to the times when he was owning everything, to the times where he was lifting everybody else up, to the final years where he was ever present in some way. I still can't believe I'm not gonna come around the corner and see Jacques, frankly, and get that sense of joy and purpose that he brought to every encounter. You wanted to live up to his level of commitment. And I think that's, that's what I'll remember the most when I think about him and the fact that he was commemorated now in this way with the cultural medallion, the fact that there's his name is on a street out there on 64th street, that sense of purpose uh, that he is giving us and always will. Uh, the last thing I was thinking about that I'd share is I'm sure many of you have seen the beautiful uh, documentary in Balanchine's classroom, uh, which recounts so much of the personal impact and the professional impact. And there's some scenes in there with Jacques and it's Jacques teaching small children. Uh, and there's a moment there that just tells you everything about Jacques. He's leading them through a bar and then he leans over the bar to this small child, probably a nine-year-old. And he said, I know it's hard. I know, he said, but if you do a good bar, you can dance. And I just thought, this is Jacques. He's sharing at every possible moment. You know, I think when you look in the dictionary and you see the word share as a verb, there should be a picture of Jacques. Thank you, Barbara Lee, for getting me the chance to share that. Well, thank you for that eloquent tribute. You know, in these very dark moments that we are all surrounded by, today's program has been a remarkable beam of hope. So thanks to each and all of you for being a part of it. And before we unveil the medallion, a brief reminder, please, join us this very Thursday, May 19th, for the next Landmarks 50 Alliance meeting, <coughs> excuse me, which will feature international photojournalist, MacArthur winner, Susan Mysalis, New York Magazine, both music and architecture critic, Justin Davidson, Pratt Institute president, Francis Bronet, and World Monuments Fund CEO, Benedict de Montleur. Details on this and all future events can be found at our webpage. And now we will unveil and read the text of the cultural medallion. Kay, perhaps you'll bring Emily with you and you will read the text and show the medallion. Thank you, Barbara Lee. Here we go. <laughs> Unveil it. Ta-ra. <laughs> Will you please read it for us as well? Sure. Jacques D'Amboise, July 28, 1934 through May 2nd, 2021. 2601 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Manhattan. Dancer, choreographer, director, and educator, Jacques D'Amboise performed with New York City Ballet for 34 years, often described as the definitive Apollo for his command of that title role. Ballet master George Balanchine choreographed more work specifically for D'Amboise than for any other dancer. His performance career extended from New York City Ballet to Broadway and to film, notably Carousel and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. In 1976, D'Amboise founded the National Dance Institute, NDI. Since its inception, NDI has shared the joy of learning through dance with millions of children and adults from all walks of life across the globe. A Pied Piper of dance, his vision was depicted in the 19, 
83 documentary, He Makes Me Feel Like Dancing. Deboise's numerous honors include the New York State Governor's Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Arts and Culture, 1986, a MacArthur Fellowship, 1990, the Kennedy Center Honor, 1995, and the National Medal of the Arts, 1998. Thank you, Kay. And special thank you to Ellen Weinstein, who spent many years helping to lead and form this organization. And thanks to you, the audience, and to all who participated in this exciting and for me, inspirational program. And if you know of an individual who has made a significant contribution and have verifiable information as to where they resided or worked or lived or played in a building that still exa exists, no phantom sites, please let us know. So our special and genuine thanks to each and all of you for joining us today to celebrate the remarkable life and work of Jacques D'Amboise. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. That was inspirational. <laughs>